Pitbull gets his own stadium, there might be worms in the food in Paris, and broadcasting legend Mike Tirico joins today's show. It's Wednesday, August 7th. I'm your guest host for one final time, John Shames, and this is Front Office Sports Today. Charles Barkley isn't leaving Turner. In fact, he's officially unretiring from the media. Earlier this month, Barkley threatened to walk away from Turner if they refused to pay the roughly $147 million left on his contract. But something has changed. In a Tuesday statement, Barkley said, quote, I love my TNT sports family. My number one priority has been and always will be our people and keeping everyone together for as long as possible. Seems as though Sir Charles is here to stay, although we can't say the same for inside the NBA. Mondo Duplantis has broken the record for pole vaulting, one that previously belonged to himself. In fact, he holds the records for the top nine highest pole vaults recorded in history, breaking the record by a single centimeter each time. Coincidentally, there's a $50,000 bonus every time someone breaks the pole vaulting record, so perhaps there is a method behind Duplantis' madness. Harrison Butker became the highest paid kicker in NFL history on Monday, agreeing to a four-year, $25.6 million extension with the Kansas City Chiefs. Butker has been a large conversation piece this offseason, first for controversial comments he made regarding gender roles, and then more recently for his expected role change under the NFL's new kickoff rules. It looks like Turner is losing its NBA rights, but don't worry, sports fans. The Savannah Bananas are here to take the association's place. The Bananas, also known as the greatest show in sports, are an exhibition baseball team whose motto is fun first. Tuesday, Warner Bros. Discovery announced that True TV would be adding five consecutive weeks of Friday night Bananas baseball in August and September. Pitbull Stadium is coming soon. Tuesday morning, the pop artist announced a new deal worth $1.2 million per season to change FIU's stadium name to his own. Pitbull is from Miami and is substantially involved in the city's sports culture. As a part of the deal, he will also be named the official entrepreneur of FIU Athletics. One day after a Belgian swimmer withdrew from her Olympic event due to E. coli, a British swimmer now alleges he found worms in his food. Adam Peaty, who won silver for the UK in the 100 meter breaststroke said, quote, it's just not good enough. The standard, we're looking at the best of the best in the world, and we're feeding them not the best. Despite reports of questionable conditions for the athletes, the Olympics have been a huge success from a media perspective. FOS reporter Mike McCarthy got to hear from the man at the center of it all in a conversation with the legendary Mike Tirico. Let's take a listen to that now. Mike, how you doing? Mike, great to speak to you again. Same here. How you doing? Good. Enjoying your work from Paris. Uh, fantastic. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, it's got a huge reaction back here. Um, you know, we were just uh, we were just talking about it, Chris and I. You know, ratings are up. Everybody's tuning in. Uh, why do you think these games have are hit hitting so much uh, that, that are being so successful? Yeah, you know, we we've, we've done a lot of meetings, had a lot of planning, and a lot of conversation. And this is what I think we all envisioned and were hoping. I think we were hoping that, one, no COVID, plus two, Paris, would give the games a little boost. And it's been a big boost. And it's not just here, it's globally. But when you think about COVID and no fans in the stands, it takes us back to watching the NFL games when there were no fans in the stands, and it just lacked atmosphere, even with some enhanced audio playing in the background. It right. just wasn't the same, right? And this is the same feel to it. Um, and I think that on top of this is such a unique approach for a host city. I mean, every time, every day, I should say, there is some iconic venue right in the middle of a great event. That hasn't happened before in the history of the games, and I've said several times Paris is one of two things you've either never been here and you can't wait to get here or you've been here and you can't wait to get back and I think when people are seeing that at home 
that just makes you feel like I want to see what's going on there. So a whole combination of things, but I think this has been the right boost at the right time for the Olympic Games. Yeah, the like, visuals like, have been I'll, incredible. Like, I'll, I'll give you an example right now. I'm on our set, and I'm overlooking where the opening ceremony finished. And right now, they're having this Champions Plaza where the public gets in for free, and they can celebrate the medal winners. And Novak Djokovic just came out, and there are about 8,000 people who waited in the 80-degree sun to see Novak Djokovic, hear him talk a couple of times, and walk around his gold medal, right? Mm. So that's a great energy, right? You can almost hear it in the background. And that has been... I think a lot of fuel for us as we do these long days every day. And this is a fun experience that we've never had before. So I hope that it's coming through the TV for everybody back home. We can't be here. It's, it certainly is, Mike. I, I want to ask you about the cool. challenge of double shifting. I mean, you're on in the afternoons, then you're the primetime host. How, how do you do that? Uh, not much sleep, but <laughs> that's okay. I uh, think... You know, it, you remind yourself every day that you get to host the Olympics and and you get through. Um, I'll tell you what the hardest three hours are for me every day. It's the three hours in between. Because you come off the early show, which is evenings here in Paris, and then it's a couple of hours sprint, whether it's taping or getting caught up on the rundown, what we're doing, and get ready for the... American primetime show. Uh, that three hours couldn't happen without the best people, starting with Molly Solomon, Rob Highland, who's producing, who's uh, attached to the hip with me, at the hip with me, since he does Sunday Night Football with us. Uh, our great research team, Jake Abrahams, is a researcher who works with us on Sunday Night Football. He knows exactly what I'm looking for, and as soon as I get off the set, he gets me completely up to speed on where we are for the primetime show. So the, the team has been amazing working together. But uh, for me personally, you know, it's somewhere around 6 a.m., get to sleep, wake up around 10.30 or so, and start a series of Groundhog's Day over and over again. <laughs> but uh, the adrenaline of the Olympics... Uh, a couple of good cups of coffee a day keep you going. These Olympics have been really star-studded. Uh, talk about working with yeah. people like Snoop and Peyton Manning. Well, I mean, it's every day in my career that I walk out and I get to sit next to Martha Stewart and Snoop Dogg, <laughs> and Martha Stewart's doing highlights with Snoop, and I'm kind of working around them. <laughs> it's totally different, and it's totally awesome. Uh, I think I knew, Mike, that the Olympics have such a broad reach culturally for the U.S. for generations, right, going back to the generation we grew up. But this has really cemented it for me. Like, Martha Stewart loves the Olympics. Snoop Dogg loves the Olympics. Alex Cooper loves the Olympics, right? So to be around all those people, you mentioned Peyton. I mean, Peyton had so much fun talking to the athletes along the way in preparation for the opening ceremony. Kelly Clarkson, same deal. So, uh... I've loved that part of it. I am passionate about sports. Sports has been my professional life, but I love music, I love politics, I love entertainment, all that stuff. And so to get a chance to be in a role where, you know, everybody uh, on the couch can range from Martha Stewart to a gold medalist. I'm sure we'll you know, talk to executives who are involved with and all that is is fun. It's a, it's a great test of your range of interests and skills, and you know it's the only time this ever happens for us professionally to get um, a run like this. I, I had said to someone, I think this was last month or so. Um, you know, you never get a chance to host seventeen straight nights of primetime network TV in America, uh, and the Olympic hosts get to do that every two years. It's such a cool assignment, and I love the fact that we've expanded it to really make it not just sports, but the cultural event that the Olympics truly are. Mike, you, you talked about our generation. You know, uh, me, you, Chris, we grew up watching and admiring these Ironman announcers who did multiple sports. Stockton, Enberg, Cassell, Gowdy, Schenkel. Uh, and to me, you seem to be the last of that breed, uh, you know, who could do 
four or five different sports, plus the Derby and all this other stuff, for your network. What is your take on that? Did you uh, emulate those guys growing up? Did you did you study them? The real idol in the business for me growing up in New York was Marv Albert. And right. I would watch Marv call Knicks and Rangers games on the radio in between doing the 6 and 11 o'clock newscast on WNBC, the NBC affiliate in New York. And then on the weekend, Marv would do boxing at Rawway State Prison, or Marv would host the baseball pregame show, right. or Marv would call the NFL, right? And the template of being a sportscaster to me was you just did everything, right? And the people you mentioned who were like that as well, in the host chair, Jim McKay, Bob Costas, those were the other people that I looked up to. So to have this opportunity was something that I was not striving for, but understood that was a possibility. But then when I was at ESPN, you had to come across every sport. So during the 90s, it was the conversant in hockey and college basketball and college football. So I think that versatility was, if you will, foundationally laid into my approach from watching the guys who I idolized growing up. And then practically when I started at ESPN, because of that sports center experience, you never knew what highlight was going to come across your desk. You just wanted to make sure you did it the right way. And it's just continued as I've kind of grown professionally. And I'm lucky that I'm at a place where I get to do that. It keeps me engaged. It keeps me enthused about what the next challenge is. And I'm still a sports fan. I love my job, Mike. I, I love that we get to wake up, watch the best athletes in the world, and get to tell their story. Uh, it still gets me motivated to work every day, and I just feel very lucky that I've been in a position to be able to do those things that you only dream of as a kid. Talk about the lineage of uh, following Olympic hosts like McKay and Bob. Um uh, you know, who were so famous and, and so great at it. And do you expect to, you know, share any screen time with Bob during these Olympics? Because I know he's in Paris. Yeah, uh, that would be great for me. You know, my, my connection with Bob goes back to Syracuse. I was the recipient of the first Bob Costas scholarship as Bob started his philanthropy at Syracuse. Uh, I was chosen as the first recipient of that scholarship. So I got to meet him in the late 1980s so i've really known bob for almost 35 years and he's been nothing but great along the way and uh you know if there's anything i'm proudest of uh regarding this job and hosting the olympics it's that uh let's see the last cbs olympics was in 98 i believe so from 2000 on every olympics game the primetime host has been a syracuse alum Wow, Bob to me, I love I love that fact, and I'm so proud of that because I love my school um, as, as much as anything. So there's there's that part of the job. Um, I got to work with Jim McKay at the end of my ABC days, uh, his his ABC days, the start of mine. Got to work three or four British Opens with him, and sit with him and talk about Munich and talk about hosting the Olympics. Never thinking it would be something in my life. I was just a curious young sportscaster getting started. So. Uh, not only have I been blessed enough to follow, quote unquote, follow those guys as prime time hosts for multiple Olympic Games, but I worked with both of them. And uh, w what a treat. And they're the best. They're the Mount Rushmore of doing this job. And there's no doubt that some of what I've watched growing up as a kid and then as an adult watching Bob, some of that hopefully sensibility, curiosity, and communication is deep inside of how we do the job. Maybe not the moment-to-moment <laughs> execution mm. of it, but you know, I, I, I've seen how the job is done by the best and just try to make sure that I'm doing my best for our network to look as good as those guys did for their networks back in the day. Has it given you any advice uh, in Paris? Bob was great when we, uh, when the, uh, when it was announced that I was taking over, which was, I guess, February of 2017. Right. I was going to host the first one for me, which is Pyeongchang. Uh, you know, Bob, Bob's advice was very simple and made a ton of sense, was just to, you know, rely on the great people who are here. And the foundation of the NBC Olympics unit that was built by Dick Ebersol 
and Jim Bell was in charge at the time that I took over. And now Molly Solomon has done just the greatest job of helping consumption looks like here in the 2020s. Uh, that's an unbelievable system. And it's a system that gives you a chance to do your job uh, and succeed at just being the point guard. And uh, Bob's probably best advice was to just rely on this great group. And I have, and uh, I'm thankful every day that I've got some smart people who are creative and just as passionate helping direct us. Uh, hopefully in the right place for the audience every day. That's what Scott Hansen told me the other day. He's like, hey, I'm an Olympic rookie, so I'm just going to put myself in their hands. By the way, you know, I, I won't mention that Hansen and Sicilian are also Syracuse guys. <laughs> so, our, uh, our, and, and, and no eagle call on the hoop. So our little, uh, I think, uh, and Jason Knapp, who's been calling swimming, and Bill Spaulding, we've got, like, I think eight or nine Syracuse guys. I'm at Farid and Post in the afternoon. We've got our little orange, orange Olympic crew. Uh, well represented here, which is uh, which is pretty special for us because we all have the fondest memories of not just our time there, but all wanting to be like Bob. And here we all are covering the Olympics, which is so darn cool. Look, Mike, I know you don't have a lot of time. I just uh, want to end with another huge story that people are excited about, which is the NBA returning to NBC. People have such fond memories of the NBA on NBC. And is there anybody who would be a dream analyst for you to, to work with? <laughs> I just want to get to day 11 of the Olympics. <laughs> and, then, and then our preseason NFL game. And then Sunday night week one. Uh, fortunately, it's down the road. Uh, but obviously, for the company to be involved in the NBA is a thrill for all of us. For me personally, my last, I guess my last 14 years at ESPN and ABC, uh, involved calling the NBA, hosting studio shows, calling the finals or hosting the finals, I think like six or seven times. Uh, I, I love the league. I've remained a fan. So uh, to be involved with it again for us, all of us, and for me personally, is something I'm excited about. But there's so much time between now and then that you know, Rick Cordella and Sam Flood and our leadership, I'm sure, will come up with their ideas of what they'd like me to do and people and all that stuff. I have not asked my wife and kids to change the ringtone when I called the round ball rock just yet. <laughs> I might hold off on that for a year. You should give it time. But, uh, man, we, to, to get the official news while we were over here, uh, get ready to start these Olympics, that was a thrill for all of us. And we are uh, super excited about what this summer has been and going forward, not just with the NBA, but all these projects like Sunday Night Football and the Olympics as well. Well, Mike, thanks for your time from Paris. Really appreciate it. Chris, thank you. Have a great day, Mike. Thank right. you. Last weekend, FOS hosted Huddle in the Hamptons, gathering some of the biggest players in the business of sports and unleashing them on the pickleball court. But before that, we got to hear from some of the former athletes who have become major players off the field, too. Let's listen in to how Midge Purse, Marcus Colston, and Wale Ogunle are changing what it means to be an athlete investor. First up, from our friends at UBS, it's Wale Ogunleye, who is with the Sports and Entertainment Industry Group at UBS. Bring it up, bring it up. I'm just going to hide this other mic that I don't think we need. Okay, next up, from the NWSL, and she made this year's Olympic team, it's Midge Purse. Give it up for Midge. <laughs> and finally, our very exciting late addition to the panel, it's Marcus Colston, who you will certainly know from the Saints. Marcus is now doing an athlete-focused VC fund that we'll hear all about. All right, guys, thank you so much for being here. Midge, we're going to get into what everyone is doing in business. I want to give everyone a chance to tell the crowd what they're up to. But i got to start with this. We are lucky enough to have you here, but it's unfortunate for you. You made this year's USWNT, the Olympic team. You're not at the Olympics. What happened? Oh, we didn't, we didn't go over this yesterday. <laughs> um, I, I tore my ACL earlier this year, um, which was unfortunate. But um, God is good, and it's a blessing in disguise. Tell us how you've been recovering and spending this time. 
Recovery's been fantastic. It actually gave me an opportunity to work on The Off Season, which is um, my company and a show that premieres this season um, in correspondence with the Indy Brazil playoffs. So I'm excited to tell you more about that, but um, it's, it's been good. Thank you for asking. Love talking about what athletes are doing in media, the streaming element, how you guys are going to distribute that show. So we'll get into that. Uh, Wale, can you tell everyone about what it is you do at UBS and, and the work with athletes? And so there's a lot of things that I do, but I think more importantly, one, working with our athletes and our entertainers, um, making sure that our advisors have the information they need to put our athletes in the best position to build their legacies, right? So for us, it's, you know, if you look at our UBS logo is the keys, and I, and I love that logo for us because it's we're giving the keys to our, our clients, more importantly, but then also our, our advisors are equipped with the keys to help our clients think about life after sports, right? Because those 15 minutes of fame are just 15 minutes. And if we are able to plan right, do the right things, get around the right people, give them the right advice, um, those 15 minutes are able to expand to a real legacy. So for us at UBS, that and, and, and creating legacies for our clients is, is what I'm doing right now. There's so much there with uh, what I often call the new playbook for athlete investing. And we can kind of talk about that in a sec. But Marcus, uh, talk about choosing to go into venture capital and how you start up an athlete-focused fund. It's uh, a very different kind of thing, and it's also a very long-term play. You've got to be patient. Yeah, absolutely. So, so this this trip um, is is kind of a round trip for me. Uh, I've been in VC um, even while I was playing. I was a, an active angel investor. Uh, I tried my hand at launching a fund back in 2017, 2018. Um, you know, in the gap in between, um, you know, just getting out in, into the world, gaining more experience, um, you know, as an executive coach, consultant, and, and just wearing a bunch of different hats. And when I got the opportunity to kind of circle back around to to this this opportunity here, um, it was one that, as you mentioned, the landscape has kind of shifted a little bit. Uh, you're starting to see more and more athletes get involved in businesses in different ways. And, you know, for me, the timing just felt right with with everything that's happening with within sport. Uh, the business of sport is changing, evolving. The role of the athlete within business is changing and evolving. Uh, it just felt like a really opportune time to launch a platform that was really focused on sports, really focused on growth stage sports opportunities, and really putting putting athletes at the forefront. Um, you know, and, and being able to drive this model. So, uh, you know, a lot of time it's it's, it's really just you know, matching up the opportunity with the timing. And, and I, th I think we're, we're in a, a really unique uh, space and time right now to be able to do something like this. What have you been investing in in the past? What do you want to invest in with the new fund? Uh, as an individual, I've, I've kind of focused on that intersection of sports and business, uh, some health and, health and wellness. Uh, I was in the cannabis space for a while on the international scene. Um, but with the, within the fund, we're really focused on the value chain of sports. Uh, when you think about and when when we typically hear about sports investment, it's it's at the big five leagues. It's you know, it's it's MLS, it's it's NFL, NBA. Uh, but we know that there are a ton of opportunities um, that that, you know, make up the value chain, make up all of the companies that make sports what it is, you know, from, you know, sports medicine to the you know, payment processing to technologies that are that are, you know, fueling performance. We, we see opportunities in, in the entire value chain and, and really being able to bring that value chain together as an opportunity to, to build a portfolio. Um, that's what we're really excited about right now. Love that. So we've talked about investing, talked about athletes planning and investing. Let's talk about media a little bit, Midge. Uh, give everyone a little bit, if they haven't seen about the show, the docuseries, which has already been filmed. What's the distribution plan? What's the hope and the goal with that first show from your company? Yeah, so the off season is a docu series reality television show. Um, it's the first of its kind. I call it a new genre that comes out premieres this season uh, at the end of the inverse L season. So come October, November, um, and it's premiering on Twitter, which is really unconventional but intentional at the same time. Uh, the idea behind that was to go to. We had a lot of conversations with a bunch of networks: the Netflix, the Who's, HBO, but the subscription model isn't the best thing for a product that you want to reach too many people and that you need people to see who don't already know about it. So the idea was how can we get the maximum number of eyeballs on something that nobody knows what it is. So we decided to go through Twitter and 
Along with my show, they are launching a new tab, a video tab, which will be on your app, and a new TV app, so it will be on your televisions as well. Very cool. And your goal, as we discussed with the company, this is just the first offering from the off-season, is kind of twofold. Bringing more attention on women's sports, fair to say, but also, of course, the NWSL, the National Women's Soccer League. Uh, tell us a little bit about kind of that effort, and uh, you are an NWSL champion. Uh, talk to us about, you know, how you think the league has gained more eyeballs, what still needs to happen in the, in the near future to get more people hip to the NWSL. Yeah, so the purpose of the show is to reform the way in which women and sport are marketed and consumed, and as well as the athletes themselves. I've always felt that the NWSL, as well as the way that women's sports in general is marketed, has been really derivative of men's sports. So I, I, play, I play in a women's soccer league, but everything is modeled after the European schedule. We call our uniforms kits instead of just like a jersey. Um, and it's the same thing with the MLS. We copy their structure and their game plans and we try to go into the same markets that they do. Um, and so the idea of doing the off season was trying to take a step back and look at the product that we have, which is completely different and a completely different audience and say, what's the correct way to market this? And for me, I felt you needed to tell stories because for men, for whatever reason, you guys can just like profit off of like performance and statistics. <laughs> I, I always talk about how my dad to a baseball game and it'll be like man hit ball and got to base and he'll be like yes this is great <laughs> but but me I need to know who the man is and like why he's there and what his story is like, to be interested in it so the idea of taking all of these athletes who are elite high level so good at their sport and then peeling back this lens and showing this is what they actually go through this is their story and allowing people to get to know those personalities and those narratives was the perfect way to kind of reform the way that we're marketed. Man, that's awesome. There's so much there. Uh, Wale, as we talk about sort of talking to athletes, both recently retired and still playing, because I feel like one shift in this whole model is everyone is thinking about these things much, much sooner. You know, it used to be, oh, I got to prepare for my second life. Now it's the minute you start. I mean, mid, you're so young and you're launching this show already and, and the athletes are doing it while they're still playing. Um, you said something interesting to me on our, on our pre-chat about even that there are things that athletes didn't used to have to think about, estate planning, I mean, things that they are asking about and planning for much sooner in their career. Yeah, I think, I mean, one, I think, you know, Mitch touched on it a little bit. At the end of the day, athletes are realizing that they're more than just athletes. I mean, just look at us up on this stage, the ability for us to transition and use our skills and our hard work and our dedication to uh, pivot into any career we want to. And I think athletes are understanding that they're brands, right? They're businesses. And we look at them at UBS as businessmen and businesswomen. Um, a lot of times when we do talk to our, our clients, uh, we don't look at them as athletes. We look at them as a, a, a client that has a, a short period of time in, in, in the professional world, but we're looking at the long scale and looking at their brands. How do we build, again, when I said earlier, their legacy? So. For us, because the athletes are making a ton of money um, early, especially with NIL now, it's imperative that they surround themselves with competent advisors, not just your mom or your brother or somebody that knows somebody, an uncle, which the way in the past, um, now it's time to really sit down with the experts like a UBS and some of our, you know, our competitors, but um, that have reputable um, reputations that match our clients. When I was in, coming up in the NFL, I wasn't sure who to talk to. I didn't know that I should be in meetings with advisors from UBS, right? Because my mom knew a guy and I trusted that guy, right? Now, that being said, I think the athletes are realizing that trust is good, but it's time to start verifying. And what you're seeing now, a lot of athletes are verifying by surrounding themselves with individuals, especially individuals here in this audience, but then also with, with firms like UBS and making sure that uh, we dot our I's and we cross our T's. And that's the biggest difference that I'm seeing with a lot of our athletes. We're not in that box anymore. And um, you're seeing, even with through COVID, um, markets, sports and entertainment is almost a bulletproof industry. Everybody wants to be entertained, no matter the time, the date, the structure, athletes and sports and entertainment will be needed. And we just hope that when uh, our clients and our prospects needs us, 
UBS will be there to answer that call. When you say athletes are, are the new brands now, I mean, yeah, a couple weeks ago, the New York Times style section, the front page said, athletes are the new everything. I thought that nails it. Uh, I want to ask both Midge and Marcus, you know, it, it's funny, Wale mentions it used to be like your cousin or your uncle would be in your ear. And that was a very common, you know, that, that was an old, used to be an easy sports business media story was about, you know, investing gone wrong or the athlete invested in a friend's business and it, and it went wrong. But there is, you know, not a downside, but there's a risk to being a current or former pro athlete who's out there saying, I've got money to invest. I mean, what uh, challenges have you guys already faced or tried to navigate when it comes to uh, making the right decisions and, and not being, you know, exploited? I think the one of the first challenges is, especially when you talk about investing, um, deal flow is however anyone can get to you, right? So um, deal flow has never really been a, a challenge for for folks that that are visible. It's it's quality deal flow, and it's how can you how can you vet really early on the companies that not just are they good companies, but are they good companies for me, my portfolio, and where I'm going? Um, you know, to to Wale's point, I, I think having the right advisors around you is key um, in, in that in that journey. But I, but I also think we're seeing a shift where athletes are taking a more active role within within their own ecosystem. Um, you know, there was a point in time where it was kind of a stigma to be able to play your sport on the field and you were kind of looked down upon for doing stuff off the field, mm -hmm. right? You're not focused or, or, you know, the main thing is not the main thing. But I think athletes are, are really starting to reposition themselves and understand that they can do two things at one time. And I think the more we're seeing athletes become active, become you know, leaders within their ecosystem, not just clients, partners within their eco ecosystem, not just clients, um, I think that evolution will continue. And ultimately, to, to your point, like I wouldn't say we're everything, but we, we can do a lot. And the, the, the ability to kind of have these nuanced conversations around, yes, I'm an athlete, I can catch a ball really well, I can run routes, I can make plays on the field, but it doesn't define what interests me off the field. And you're starting to see people really follow those, those interests, whether it be media, uh, whether it be technology, whether it be um, you know, these other industries that you're starting to see athletes really, really you know, stake a claim in. Um, I think that evolution is just gonna continue and the more people that do it, the more people are gonna see it. And you know, with NIL coming along, we're, we're gonna start seeing people make that transition faster and faster and quicker and quicker. And um, you know, I think with that, with that that trajectory, I think the sky is the limit for what athletes can do in the business world. Yeah, I, th I really agree with you. And I actually think that being an athlete is probably one of the only professions where your ability to do something really well also somehow suggests that you have an inability to do so many other things unwell. <laughs> um, but to answer your, your other question, it would probably just be financial literacy and prioritizing that. My dad's a stockbroker, so I feel like I grew up with that as a priority. So, yeah. <laughs> no, I'd also listen, I'll add on that. I think the education part of it is, is huge. And then, two, the fact that the world, not only just athletes, you know, say they have the money, but the world sees it, right? Anytime a, your favorite athlete signs a new contract, it's on the front page of the New York Times, of the USA Today. And for us as athletes, the, uh, it's not just our, our local community, or our local ecosystem like it was in the past, like your mom may have wanted you to open up a salon or an uncle wanted you now to uh, open up a, a, a gas station um, or a laundromat to make some, some cash flow. Now you're seeing these corporations and, and these funds coming at these athletes because they see the capital. And again, like I said in the past, even during tr trying times, these contracts are still being signed. So these corporations look at these athletes as guaranteed money that's going to continue to flow. And for us, like Mitch said, it's, it's huge for us as an industry to educate these athletes as they're going, hold their hands through the process, and then hopefully uh, build the legacy that I always talk about. Man, this is great. I, I always feel like we only get to barely scratch the surface. We're, we're almost up here, but I am certainly going to hound all three of these guys to do individual interviews with us at FOS, so check the site soon. Let's wrap this way. Uh, I've got three great speakers here, so I want to do a quick lightning round. Okay, we're going to do two questions in the lightning round. First up, can you name a couple pro athletes, current or former, 
that you personally really look to and think are doing it right when it comes to business decisions? We start with Wallace. Oh, man. <laughs> so obviously, we have confidentiality at UBS, but I think we have a ton that I work with that are doing amazing. Um, we got the right advisors. But for me, for public knowledge, I think a guy like Shaquille O'Neal is doing an amazing job. I was just talking earlier today about uh, with uh, Constance, who's here. Deion Sanders actually has done an amazing job with his brand and what he's doing. So light, lightning around. Uh, Simone Biles and Jason Kelsey. I'll go Ryan Neese and what he's doing with Next, uh, Next Legacy. Love that. Good lightning round answers. Next question, we've talked about so many different areas. We've said athletes are the new everything, they're brands, they're doing all kinds of different things. As we gaze into our crystal ball in the next five to 10 years, which specific area is most interesting to each of you right now, whether it's a business category, uh, a, a certain type of venture? I'll say just, just the athlete business model is, is intriguing to me because it keeps changing, right? It, it started as endorser, it's become investor, um, entrepreneur. So, so that athlete business model evolution is, is interesting to me. Okay, um, I think the ownership, I think the next step is athletes now becoming owners. They will see with the Las Vegas basketball team that there's probably gonna be a prominent NBA player that's going to be the majority owner of that team. So I, I would say ownership of, of NFL, I mean, of uh, professional teams. Feel free to break some news if you haven't. No, no not here, not today. I'm gonna, I'm gonna cop out and jump on the ownership. That's a good answer. That's all we've got for today and all I've got as your guest host. Thank you to everyone who has tuned in over the past week as I filled in for the very talented Owen Poindexter, who will be back tomorrow. Make sure to let a friend know, regularly scheduled programming is back. This has been Front Office Sports Today. We'll talk tomorrow.